So today we're lucky enough to be performing a transcranial duplex study um, using the transtemporal approach and Scott is going to be actually performing the exam and we'll be talking about what we're visualizing on the screen. We start out with the grayscale display and then we will use the intracranial landmarks to then help us know what we are looking at with the intracranial anatomy and, um, and the vasculature. So we'll begin by um, focusing with the transducer positioned um, on the temporal window um, and Scott is angling ever so slightly to optimize uh, the grayscale display and to uh, document the uh, intracranial bony landmarks. And we will be, um, we're using the landmarks to help us know sort of where we are and um, where to, to uh, position the, uh, the color box for displaying flow of the vascular anatomy. Now Scott's going to talk as well and tell us what he's looking at on our perfect model and obviously in the clinical setting your patients may not always be this cooperative and um, they may not be this young and have good temporal bones but this really is a wonderful dis uh, demonstration of how well you can visualize the intracranial anatomy. It's really quite remarkable so that um, even in an optimal, a suboptimal patient we can probably get very good results. And these landmarks are where we're going to start with the petris and sphenoid bones and as we angle, as when I turn color on, I'm going to expect to see the carotid siphon in this area. And we'll do a little adjusting with the transducer to go ahead and get the siphon. That's beautiful. It certainly makes it easier to have that color display when you're trying to identify the vasculature mm -hmm. than just uh, blindly looking for a signal. And we'll go ahead and throw a pulse Doppler on here. Now we are using a transducer. This is using a, a frequencies of between 5 and 1 megahertz. Okay. So we will go ahead and sample this. So this system has an actual transcranial uh, software package so that uh, the, the mean velocity is going to automatically be calculated when you place the envelope follower in place. And it will be optimizing the signal for TCD. Just come out of Doppler and we're just going to angle the transducer and come up into the circle of Willis looking at the MCA and the ACA. Just turn the color gain up a little bit. Now as with non-imaging we can tell the difference in uh, the vasculature based on flow direction, um, so the color is very helpful in not only demonstrating the course of the vessel and the curves and the, and the you know, the, the position of the vessel, but also uh, the flow direction. So we can clearly see the middle cerebral artery, which is the larger and the ro more robust of the vessels, and then the anterior cerebral artery moving towards the midline. In addition, you can actually see the contralateral ACA and MCA as well. Now Scott has positioned the sample volume within the middle cerebral artery. Um, you can see a nice um, envelope follower, a nice spectral display, um, and um, even a little bit of a reverse flow here where he's picking up a, probably a branch vessel. So the sample volume depth is at about uh, five centimeters. Uh, you can see the display of the peak systolic velocity as well as the end diastolic, which are also used in the overall calculation um, of, of the data. But the mean velocity or the time average peak is 58 centimeters per second. And as I walk shallower with the sample volume, we're coming up into the M2 segment, which is right around here. And you can see it on, gray, on color Doppler very easily as far as where the M1 and M2 segment that's beautiful. So now if you change the size of the um, sample volume, you can just show the... So if I go. decrease it, I came down to a sample volume size here of four millimeters. And we're up in the M2 segment. But normally most of the literature has used a fairly large sample volume because it helps you find the vessel and track the vessel uh, more easily, I think. If you make the sample volume so small, you're, you're looking for small vessels and having a small sample volume is really just going to make it much more difficult. So a fairly large sample volume so is usually optimal. Take that back to seven and a half. And we're going to now come down. We've sampled the MCA all the way out. We're going to come down and look at the MCA to ACA, and this should be bidirectional flow showing both vessels. Mm -hmm. 
and as I take my sample volume slightly deeper, we will drop into the ACA. So this is really the most repeatable and reliable intracranial landmark, and it's what we always go back to as really the, the resource for knowing where we are and what we're evaluating. This is the area where we would expect to find um, increased velocities in children with sickle cell anemia or in patients with vascular disease because, as we know, at bifurcations, that tends to be the point at which we have higher velocities. So and that's beautiful. to the distal ACA also here. So you can really track that ACA quite a distance, can't mm -hmm. you? So that helps you make sure that you know that you followed the ACA and that you've tracked it to the midline. That's as far as we're going to go. Okay. Now can you show me again the ICA because that's really a, a critical vessel and one that's very difficult to evaluate with the non-imaging. There we go. So it, it almost is circular or elliptical and mm -hmm. in, in, in because you've angled a little I'm inferiorly. A little inferior mm -hmm. and I did a small clockwise rotation of the transducer very slightly. Okay, okay. And you can hear a little harshness there in the ICA, which is what we normally expect. A little bit of baseline uh, disturbed flow there as well. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay. I'll go back to our landmark, and now we will angle posterior. I'll move my color box and look at the posterior branch now, posterior segments. So the reason this is important is that it, it, in the days before we had the beautiful images, we would sometimes follow the PCA if it was carrying a lot of collateral flow and miscall it as the middle cerebral artery. So we found that it was very helpful to know that we had documented the, the anterior and the posterior circulation separately. So that shows the top of the basilar where the basilar artery has bifurcated into the P1 section segments of the PCA. And then there you can see the, the color differentiation and then as the vessels wrap around the, the brain stem, you can see that they actually appear to change direction too because of their angling. So once again, at the midline, we have a, um, almost a bi-directional signal again because we, if we increase the size of the sample volume, you actually can get both PCAs at that point. So that you can see the PCA mean flow velocity is much lower than we saw in the middle cerebral artery, and that's another hallmark sign that you have actually separated the anterior and the posterior circulations. Very nice. And just angling. Okay, so that would be the P2 sec segment. That's really nice. Um, so if we could just go back and show them sort of the, the course of the MCA and, mm -hmm. and changing the color box and showing how that impacts the quality. So if we were doing a, a full clinical exam, we would track through the entire course and take samples at each, at what do you usually do? Four millimeters, two to four, millimeters. four millimeters? Because with the nine image you couldn't see, so we did them at two, but with the imaging, because you can visualize the vessel, I think four is probably adequate. It's also very easier too to, with visualization of the vessel, you can walk it right through the sample volume mm -hmm. and exactly pinpoint the exact area where you have the highest velocities. Right. Okay. So if we narrow our color box here, we will see better frame rates, and you're actually increasing your color sensitivity. So if you had a patient who had vasospasm or a very tight stenosis, this might help you um, optimize the signal better. I'm just going to increase my color PRF slightly to reduce some of the aliasing mm -hmm. at the peak systole in the MCA. You can actually see some of the branches in the MCA out there in that distal portion. That's very nice. So should we... Go posterior? Yes, we'll try posterior. Turn up on your side. So when you want to evaluate the posterior circulation and look at the vertebral basilar system, you just have the patient turn to their side and tilt their chin to their, to their chest so that you can actually open up this area and uh, have them relax so that it doesn't get, the muscles don't get too tight. So you're actually um, shining the, trans, the, the ultrasound through the opening of the frame and magnum. Just searching around looking for the best window. Mm -hmm. And once you have your vessels, you can just turn on your transducer to 
be able to follow those into the skull. That's beautiful. So the sample volume is at about 5.5. So you can see the, the, the peak systole in the posterior circulation is quite a bit lower than the anterior circulation, which is what you would expect. Then you can just track the vessels and depending on the patient presentation, whether they're a vascular disease patient, you may want to look at the vertebrals in the basal or whether it's just documenting flow with the TCD study for, as, a, as a baseline. Just not really seeing me. There it was. Yep. Very nice. Okay. So when we're doing the, the orbital exam, particularly in children, if you find it necessary to do it, it's good to put the, the gel over the on the transducer. Now I do have an orbital preset on the system that I can go into that mm -hmm. will automatically reduce my power levels. Okay. So we're using a mechanical index of 0.1. All right. And if we need be, we can't go lower. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. So we're positioning the transducer over the eye, the closed eyelid, and uh, angling so that we can evaluate the flow in the ophthalmic artery. Wow, that's beautiful. So normally when the flow is coming up the... The ophthalmic artery is the first branch of the internal carotid, so the flow would be towards the transducer coming out of the orbit. If the ophthalmic is serving as a collateral, then we would see actually a reversal in this signal. This can also be used to track the ophthalmic into the siphon and, and evaluate the carotid siphon, particularly if you have an older patient who has a very thick skull and you can't get a good signal, um, you can actually evaluate the siphon. But I would imagine with the, with the imaging systems that you really don't encounter that problem too much anymore. You can generally uh, assess the temporal window. Very nice. So that would be a complete transcranial imaging exam. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.